Okay. Well, welcome everybody to the second uh, talk of our physics uh, cafe talk series. So this evening uh, we have uh, one of our colleagues from the National Physical Laboratory, Dr. Andrew Henson, who is going to talk uh, about uh, very low temperatures, so he's going to play with liquid nitrogen, of hopefully not splashing too much liquid nitrogen around the place. So hopefully you will enjoy it and uh, please ask as many questions as possible at the end and uh, enjoy physics. So I'll leave it to you. Thank you very much indeed, thank you. So, um, I, wasn't, I really wasn't sure what this evening was going to be like um, and in communicating with Elisabetta she forwarded to me this question is he going to do what he did at the MPL Open Day and I wasn't sure whether that meant we don't want you to do what you did at the MPL Open Day or we do want you to do at what you did at the MPL Open Day so I hope both those camps will be happy with what I have to present tonight which is just a lot of fun with liquid nitrogen. But also I want to use it as a vehicle to explain to you how I, as a professional scientist, try and engage the outside world with the science that I or my organization does. So let's look at what we've got to show you. Okay, so at home you'll have one of these, a kettle. And you switch it on, eventually, and liquid in there boils and you think so what I've spent my entire life looking at liquids boiling and there's no fascination there's nothing interesting in that whatsoever and in a curious way that's exactly what I'm going to show you again it's just that the liquid I'm going to show you here is boiling at a different temperature to this D does anybody know what temperature water boils at 100. Yeah, for that you win an MPL brain. Wow, for being the first person this evening to deign to say something. Thank you. Yeah, 100 degrees Celsius, kind of almost by definition. And um, of course that, that boiling temperature will vary with the pressure. So at the top of a mountain, at the top of Everest, it might be 80 degrees Celsius it boils at. Down at the bottom of the see very very low down it might be 240 degrees celsius that it boils at it, the, the temperature that water boils at does vary with, with pressure so maybe it's not as simple a, a question as as um as you might think it might be anyway eventually it's going to boil what i've got over here is liquefied air so it's kind of gone the other way around here, here we've got liquid water that's normally, we're familiar with it being in a liquid state and when we boil it, it turns into a gas, a gaseous state that we're not quite so familiar with. Here we've got the gas that is the air and we've, which we are familiar with, we're familiar with just going like that and feeling it, which has been cooled down to a hideously low temperature and so that it's a, a liquid that we're a little bit unfamiliar with. So let's pour this liquid out. And I feel that you should all be a little bit more familiar with what we've got here. So I'm going to do it here. This is called a Dewar, invented by Sir James Dewar. And there's a clericue, which is a bit like a limerick, which is a poem about Sir James Dewar. It goes, Sir James Dewar is cleverer than you are because none of you asses can liquefy gases. So there you go. Um, so this is a thermos flask, actually. The outside I can touch, the inside I can't. Um, it's insulated by a, a, a kind of partial vacuum between the outer and the inner part of the vessel. So I'm gonna pour this liquid from here into this container, here we go. And you'll notice So there's this, what do you think this stuff here is? Steam. I told you it's cold. <laughs> there's not steam. Fog, yes, it's fog. You, yeah, you get another brain. Well, you get, you get a brain. A brainy table here. Yeah, um, a lot of people might say steam 
because they've seen this sort of thing happening when you boil a kettle. Look, it's coming out here as well. Can you see? Uh, you can't see steam. Steam is invisible. Steam are very, 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 very tiny droplets of water, so small you cannot see them. Now, if there's a, if hot air meets cold air, the water in the warm air condenses from tiny droplets that you can't see to larger droplets that you can see. And we call that mist or fog or cloud. So actually what you're seeing here is, is just, this is, this is cloud here, and I can kind of put my hand there. You would not put your hand at the part of a kettle where you can't see anything as, as it's coming out. That's very, very hot. That's a, probably above 100 degrees Celsius. That's dangerous. But whenever you have hot water, sorry, hot air meeting cold air, you have this condensation of droplets of water. We call that cloud. And you're very, very familiar with that because we live on a land mass where we're always getting hot air meeting cold air. We call them fronts, weather fronts. And you get clouds there as a result. So what we're seeing here basically is, is a suggestion that there's either something very hot in there or something very, very cold. And I'm going to put the top on there to make it a little bit safer. And it's cold. How can I prove it's cold? I can prove it's cold by putting something in it. And normally I get a flower and I stick the flower in there and I smash the flower. But that's evil science, so I'm not going to do that. Sorry. But I am going to pour some of this into here, put it there so you can actually see it. And you can see it just vigorously boiling away. You can probably see it in real life as well. And again, this is another one of these thermos flasks. The outside is a glass envelope, the inside is more glass, and in between there's, a, there's, a not, there's something similar to a vacuum. And at some point it will stop boiling. And all it's doing is it's cooling down the inside. And this is a bit like boiling water, except that's boiling at what temperature? 100. What temperature, does anyone know what temperature this is boiling at? I'm looking at this table, they've, they've a head in the brain steak already. <laughs> Nought? Nope. Minus 180? In, in Celsius, minus 196 Celsius. Minus 19, go on, go wow. <laughs> minus 196 Celsius, that's cold. So this is a liquid that is boiling at minus 196. Wow, uh, what can I show you? I can, I can put a balloon in, uh, sorry, I can put a, a, a tennis ball in this. This, this is called activity. This is actually a tea thermos flask. It's designed to put your hot tea in there. It's actually got a top that you can put on um, to keep your, your tea nice and hot. Yeah. So, so I, I think what I'm saying is, yeah, you can you can put boiling water onto a glass container, and it won't necessarily shatter. So this was, an, this was an ordinary tennis ball. It is an ordinary tennis ball still now. I should have sort of demonstrated how normal it was, but now I'm cooling it down to such hideously toad temperatures, its properties are going to change by quite a lot. So here we go. It's not bouncy anymore. I'm actually going to use these gloves to handle this because it's pretty, pretty cold. I dare say if I kind of threw it hard enough, it would, it would shatter. 
but I'm not going to because I need to, this for my next demo when I do it again. So I, I hope that kind of convinces you that this is not just boiling water. <laughs> you wouldn't expect to see that if it was boiling water. And that uh, kind of brings us to the idea of temperature. Temperature is something to do with the speed of molecules. And if you slow the molecules down, they have a lower temperature. Does that make sense? Yeah. So I thought, just for fun, all right, we're kind of all, let's, let's uh, could, could you hold this here? This is the lowest possible, t there is a lowest possible temperature, uh, below which you can't go. And if, if, um, if you think of temperature as being the speed of things moving, what's the slowest things can move at? Stop, yes. <laughs> yeah, not moving at all. So you can imagine, like, if I just keep cooling things down and down and down, eventually they'll reach a point where they're not moving at all. So actually, philosophically, it's quite easy to think of there being a lowest temperature. And that's what you've got there, the lowest possible temperature. I did a bit of research when I was sort of putting this story together, and I discovered there was this, the hottest possible temperature, which is that, <laughs> whatever that means. I didn't understand what it meant when I kind of saw that that was there, but apparently there is a hottest possible temperature. It's to do with the physical laws of matter. So you guys, can you kind of you be the hottest possible temperature? Right, fine. What about water boiling? What, what temperature do you think water boils at? 100. Yeah, cool, so 100. You, can you take this and stand somewhere in between the two, I'm guessing. For what it's worth, Let's see what that is in Celsius. Yeah, a stupidly large number. That's, that's about 100. So you're quite, you're quite close to her. What's the coldest thing in your house? The freezer. Freezer, yeah. At minus 18 or so. So could, could you join the temperature scale some, somewhere between those two? I think somewhere over here. When I, when I do this sort of quiz in schools, I take this into schools as well, I usually say, what's the coldest thing in your house? And some child pipes up, my sister's heart. <laughs> anyway, no, it's your freezer at about minus 18 Celsius. At that temperature, biology kind of doesn't bother to do anything. Uh, it just desiccates. I mean, you can keep food in a fridge, in a freezer forever and ever and ever. And it, well, in permafrosts, you can dig out a mammoth. It's just, it's dried out during that time. What water does at such low temperatures is it sublimes. It changes from a solid straight into a gaseous form and just kind of disappears off. You, you, you might have heard of um, carbon dioxide subliming from a solid to a, a gas. The water does that at minus 18. So there's a great um, experiment where you, you put some ice cubes in your freezer and then just watch them disappear. It's like they're evaporating off. And they come off and they stick to the inside of the freezer and that's why your freezer gets clogged up. And, that's, and so when, when you see, don't keep meat beyond this date, it's not that it's not good to eat, it's just that it's desiccated and it becomes really, really chewy. Uh, so that's the reason why meat's got sell-by dates, yes? So have a milk yes, absolutely. Yes, you can use that as, as, as the desiccation pro uh, process. What about a fridge? Can you be a fridge? Plus four, isn't it, the ideal? Yes, oh yes, it's written on the back, yes. <laughs> yeah, so the fridge is about plus four. And recently, we bought some food from a supermarket, and we thought, oh, we're not gonna be able to get home. And luckily, the outside was about, minus, it was about three degrees Celsius, so we just left it in the car all day. It's great. Okay, uh, water freezing. Can you be water freezing? Go and stand where you think that should go. And, uh, what's the hottest thing in your house? Gas fire. Gas fire? Nope. Nope. Do you know? Yep. Tungsten light bulb, which is about 2,700 Celsius. We let our children play with the, the light switch, switching on and off the hottest thing in your house. Okay, so he's going to go there. Uh, the coldest place on earth. Would you like to be the coldest place on earth? It's Vostok Research Station in Antarctica. In the Antarctic, not only do you not see a lot of the sun, but also you're, you've got quite high mountain ranges. 
and with altitude comes a drop in temperature. So the south, south Pole is colder than the North Pole. So you're, yep, you're colder than your freezer. Would you like to be the sun's surface? The sun's surface is, well, about 6,000 degrees Celsius. Inside the sun, it's a lot, lot hotter than that, it's millions of degrees, but this is just the sun's surface. There's more. You're like, oh, this one has to be you. <laughs> a healthy Englishman's armpit. Okay, where do you think that should go? This guy's had a long day, so I need to keep him awake by giving him crazy things to do. So, where do you reckon I'm going to go? Okay, I'm sure butter would not melt in your mouth, so you'd be, you'd be that one. And we're running out of people. Uh, can you do the hottest bath you can stand? Can you do nitrogen boiling? Are you up for this? Go on for two seconds, you be a candle flame, I'll tell you if any punters come in. Can you, can you be nitrogen freezing? And I'll be the temperature on Pluto. Actually, you want to take a photograph, don't you? So, you, yeah. I'll, I'll do two. You take the photo. Right. Uh, nitrogen freezing is somewhere around there. They're actually, the number's written on the back. Temperature on Pluto. Can you kind of work out where that is? Right. You can take a photo of this. <laughs> Brilliant. Candle flame. Uh, candle flame between water boiling and tungsten light. Fantastic. Right. We you take the Ubu photo of this lot? <laughs> My temperature scale. <laughs> We've got just the right number of people, haven't we? <laughs> Almost. Brilliant, thank you. Thank you. Did you know you were going to be photo stars today? <laughs> now the craziest, I didn't just randomly choose these things. Some of them look completely random. But I have to tell you that these, most things here, most things, have at some point been considered as a, 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 a point on a temperature scale. Now we know about water boiling being the 100 degrees Celsius point. We know about water freezing being the zero point. So zero, 100. Those are kind of the, the, the Celsius scale. Yeah, that's they're, they're fixed there. But a healthy Englishman's armpit really was considered to be part of a temperature scale at some point, as was butter melting, as was the hottest bath you can stand, as was water, uh, mm, candle flame as well, I think. So these points have all been thought of as places to anchor a temperature scale onto. Wow, okay, fantastic. Can you put them all to Mr. Hottest Temperature and he'll collect them up and thank you very much. You're back to your seats, please. Thank you. Thanks. Let me tell you a little bit more about this temperature because I did read up a little bit more about it. Um, it's to do with the fact that some physics Dis, uh, there's a kind of rule of physics that you can't get smaller than a particular wavelength of light. You just, there's a limit to the way the world can work. And related to that emission of energy, if you like, is a particular temperature. So the limit is on the wavelength of light, uh, which is, would be very, 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 very small, which would contain a huge amount of energy, and the temperature of something creating that light would be this temperature, which is insanely hot. And I, th I thought about this, and I spoke to a, a cosmologist about it, and he said, well, if you think about it, the universe contains heat. Um, heat is, is kind of motion energy of material. And the average temperature of the universe is only 2.7 degrees above the coldest temperature that we spoke about, okay? So the average temperature of the universe is very, very low, but there's a lot of universe, so there's quite a lot of heat. So if you think about the Big Bang, the fact that we started off as kind of a singularity, a point where the entire universe was smaller than the size of an atom, all of the heat of the universe would have been contained in a very, very small volume. Does that make sense? 
and you ask yourself the question, how small would the volume of the universe be to contain that amount of heat, for, for that amount of heat to be at that temperature? Um, or put another way is, how soon after the creation of the universe would that point be? And the answer is, in terms of how close you are to the beginning of the creation of the universe, 10 to the minus 40 tooth of a second. That's very, very soon after the creation of the universe, and with the universe extremely small, smaller than an atom. Before that, our physics simply does not work. It, it just doesn't work at all. Gravity and all the other forces are kind of on the same scale and they'll, they'll, we just don't understand it. It makes absolutely no sense whatsoever. And a lot of Stephen Hawking's work is, is involved in trying to look into these things and trying to work out a unification of all of these different forces and how they would behave before 10 to the minus 40 tooth of a second after the beginning of the universe. That's a bit over the top, isn't it? I thought this would be a light, fun thing, splashing liquid nitrogen about, and I'm talking about creation. So let's splash some liquid nitrogen about. Um, I, talked, I talked about uh, taking liquid and boiling it and converting it from a liquid into a gas. Well, let's do exactly the reverse. So I've got a container here of liquid nitrogen, and I've got a, a vessel here into which I'm going to put some gas. <coughs> it's a slightly bizarre balloon, isn't it? So in here is a mixture of about 21% oxygen, 78% something like that nitrogen, about 1% argon, a little bit of carbon dioxide, a little bit of water vapour and a few other bits and pieces. And that's gaseous air at about, in here it feels like it's about 30 degrees Celsius, but I think it's probably about 25. I've got a thing here that will measure the temperature, so it will tell me actually, oh, it's saying the floor is 35. It's actually telling me that the battery is running out on this. It's telling me that the floor is 38. I just don't believe that. Okay. So in there is some air in gaseous form. What do you think will happen if I pour cold liquid nitrogen, for that's what this is, on top of it? What do you think will happen? So It will shrink. You've seen this before, haven't you? <laughs> yes. And the reason that it shrinks is because if you think about the atoms, the molecules in there, as they slow down, they take up less space. They're not moving around so much. And as you change from being a gas to being a liquid, you change from being great distances apart as molecules to being really, really close to each other as molecules. So you need a lot, lot less space to, to be where you are. So yeah. So I'm using this to cool down the air inside. I'm using liquid air to cool gaseous air. And you can hear that the, the rubber of the balloon is kind of going crackly as well. That's because normally um, the rubber of balloons is quite, the, the, the molecules are quite ductile and they move like soap over each other. But when they get cold, like a lot of us, you get quite crotchety and you get sort of scratchy and that's what you can hear. You, so you can hear the, the molecules scratching up against each other. So this, the air is still in here. It's just it's no longer a gas. It's a liquid occupying, a, getting on for 700th of the volume. We call that the gas constant, which is the proportion of volume between the liquid and the gas. So liquid air, or liquid nitrogen, if I'm being really specific, takes up a 700th of the volume of its of, of gaseous air. Oh my goodness, it's coming back to life again. Because the air is in there all the time, it's just when it was in there, it was rattling around as a liquid 
inside the balloon. So it's still in there, it's just that now it's... And now it's gone back to sky. Do you want to pass that around? And as a scientist, this is great because I can borrow this liquid nitrogen from NPL, where I work, and I can go to the party with all the balloons pre-inflated in my balloon TARDIS. I can fit about 50 balloons in here. Ouch! I'm making sure they're not too cold by the time I throw them at you. This has all been risk assessed. So you can just about, you can feel it's cold and you can still feel it, just gr that last bit of growing as, as it uh, warms up that last bit. So there it is. Oh, can I just splash them on the floor for the hell of it? I think I can. Whoa. Oh, that, that may happen. <laughs> so, if I just do this, you'll notice it kind of rolls across the ground. I wouldn't stand on it. The venue will love this because um, this is actually cleaning as it goes. It carries the dust front with it. Shall I just do some towards you guys? Ready? Here we go. Let me show you what's happening here on the, on the film as well, on the video. Oops. Oops. Can you see that? The little droplets do not boil off immediately. They dance around. They seem to last a bit longer than they really ought to. Has anyone seen anything like this before at home? Snooker. Snooker? Yeah. But this is all this is pretty frictionless actually. How about a hot frying pan? If you get a really, really hot frying pan, you heat it to about 150 or a bit more than that, and you put water onto it, the, the droplets start to behave like this. They don't boil off instantly, they just kind of rattle around. Two things are happening here. One, they don't boil off instantly, which you might think they would because the temperature difference is so big. And two, there's this kind of frictionless moving around. And the two things are caused by the same physical ac action going on, and that's the fact that these things are boiling. They're boiling in all directions. The gas is going up, sideways, and down. And the gas that goes down acts as a kind of barrier. One, it supports the weight of the droplet, but two, also, it acts as a thermal insulator, a barrier preventing the, the heat of the tray from instantly warming it up and boiling it off. So the gas acts as an insulator. So it's a bit like you put a rubber glove on the droplet, which is fantastic. This is called the Liebenfrost effect, which sounds like something that happens to people in Austria in the winter. But it's not. It's named after a I think his name is Gottfried von Liedenfrost. And it's this effect that actually makes this stuff curiously safe. I would not pour boiling coffee or hot coffee on my hand. But I think I know what will happen if I do this. The layer of gas between the really, really cold liquid here and my hand will protect me. I'm going to put my faith in the Liedenfrost effect. And the lady with the camera is getting very excited. <laughs> and I'm getting quite scared. 
Here we go. Are you ready? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It really is really, really cold. It's about minus 200. That's I pretended that. But um, it really is about minus 200. But this gaseous layer is protecting my hand from the insane, insanely cold temperature, preventing my hand from burning. And the burn that I would get from this would be exactly the same as a chemical burn or a heat burn. It's the disruption of the cell membrane, literally my cells bursting. Um, but no, that doesn't happen because I'm protected by this gaseous layer. Are there any adults here who would like to have a go? Your hand went up very quickly. <laughs> yeah, come on. <laughs> I've got, I, won't, I won't bother to get you to sign the disclaimer form, but because uh, you, look, you look sensible enough. So you're going to ask you to pull that up a bit. We don't want any sort of clothing, cloth in the way. Hold your hand at about 45 degrees, fingers apart, downwards, no piercings. Uh, okay, you ready? Yep. Are you sure? <laughs> Here we go. Ah, that is funny. <laughs> <laughs> that is funny, he says. Ready to do it again? Well, so what did it feel like? Warmer than water. Warmer yeah, than water, it's just, yeah. It's just, yeah. You, you feel the weight of it, don't you? Yeah. 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 So, it, it, but it doesn't feel wet because no. it doesn't stick to you. I think, I think wetness is kind of stickiness, isn't it? I guess so. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. tell your mates this bloke <laughs> threw some liquid at minus one nine six over my hand. <sighs> Would anyone else have a, have a go? Yeah. You, yeah. You right. Your dad is giving permission for this. Unfortunately, old enough. Unfortunately, old enough. Right. Okay. Okay. Right. So fingers apart. Okay. Ready? It's really smooth. Smooth. Yeah. yeah. It's like I just put hand cream on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, every self respecting scientist puts, you know, hand cream that is liquid nitrogen on their hands. Yes. That, that um, was quite strange. Yeah. But and it wasn't cold. No. But you, you kind of feel a sort of prickly ish sort of feeling, don't you? Yeah, like all of the hair stand, yeah. stand up. Yeah. But it's not cold. And you're not as hairy as us two, so. <laughs> He's, he's just tweeting something on. I've just been frozen by some idiot, insane person. <laughs> Let me out of here. That's the police you're contacting now, is it? Um, yeah, you haven't got quite so many hairs that will trap it, so yeah. Not that you can see. No, anyway, thank, thank you very thank much. You. Thanks. So it's this leaving frost effect that actually protects you. And uh, the leaving frost effect also comes into play with kettles. And if you boil a kettle, as the liquid turns into a gas, the gas then acts as a thermal insulator, so the heating element of the kettle suddenly becomes less efficient in heating the liquid. So when a kettle boils, suddenly, at the boiling point, it's not working so well. So a well-designed kettle will circulate the water around and, 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 and will work better. And this is more of a problem with a boiler, for example, where you, you're boiling lots of liquid and you want it all at a, a high temperature. Now we. I, I told you that as we expand the volume occupied by liquid um, air to gaseous air, the, the volume increases by a, factor, by a factor of about 700. With water, the volume increases 1700. So a steam engine is a fantastic way. You just heat the liquid, suddenly it wants to occupy 1700 times the volume. And that creates a head of pressure that can drive a piston or whatever it is you want to do. So um, in the case of one of these, what you wanted to do is to tell you that it's boiling. And it does that by having a whistle on here. So instead of putting boiling water in this kettle, I'm going to put liquid nitrogen in a kettle. and. Uh, as it boils, it's going to drive air out of the whistle. Well, that works quite well. Good. I have to be careful not to touch that now because that is cold. Um, what about uh, other explosions. Oh yes, we could do you do, we could do that with this. Um, so if I put some liquid air, which occupies, you know, whatever it is it occupies, and then as it boils off it expands, the, the head of it, gas will 
sometimes blow the top off one of these. Sometimes. Not this time. These are quite loose fitting lids, I think that's where it's gone wrong. Let's try again. Whoops. Right, that worked, didn't it? Right. So this is what we call a controlled explosion. And it's great fun. My family liquid nitrogen show that I take to theatres and schools, there are about six of us firing these off simultaneously and they're all going everywhere. Oh dear. Nothing <laughs> like an explosion is there. Oh, right, okay, but well, that, that could go on for quite a while, couldn't it? And there's a guy called Hero in AD94, AD94, who noticed this thing with the kettles and the head of steam coming out of a kettle. So um, he built something quite similar to what I've got here, um, a spherical vessel. This is a ping pong ball and I've drilled a hole into it and then I kind of bent the hole sideways so the, the hole is going kind of like that. Does that make sense? So I'm going to cool this down. Hero, of course, didn't use liquid nitrogen or a ping pong ball. He had a sort of kettle thing and he had water in it. But it was the same sort of idea. What I'm going to do now is, is uh, it's just like the balloon. The, uh, the ping pong ball is now cooling down inside so the gas inside the ping pong ball is turning from a gas into a liquid. Um, it's also, there's less pressure in there, so it's sucking some of the liquid in through the hole from the, the, the liquid around it. So we're going to end up with a cold ping pong ball containing a little bit of liquid air at a low temperature. Uh, let me just pan that out a bit. Now, as it, as it warms up, the air is going to start expanding and it will start coming out of that little hole. Oop, come on. There it goes. So now we have a steam engine. So this was called Hero's Steam Engine, AD 94 in ancient Greece. A guy invented the steam engine and they just thought, oh, that's interesting. And they left it at that. Now if they just carried on with that just a little bit more, we would be in technologically in the year 4000 now. We would probably be out conquering galaxies so I don't know if that's a good or a bad thing that we didn't <laughs> seize upon that opportunity and notice a, a, a fundamental game changer of technology. So that, that's a steam engine. Literally just converting that head of pressure into motion that could then be used to drive something or just look at and think that's interesting, which is what the Greeks did with it. So that's my hero's engine. Let's, let's look at kind of a, a slightly more modern piece of uh, technology. These are really, really powerful magnets, which is why I've got that sign there that says, danger, don't get close to these magnets. And I've got here a, a, a material, yttrium, barium, coal, carbon oxide, YCBO. They're little black pucks in there. They look like magnets. And this almost alchemical collection of, um, of uh, mixture, of elements, if you cool them down below a certain temperature, they start to behave in a very, very odd way. What actually happens is that the electrons gang up in pairs and start to move around extremely freely inside your material. And I mean extremely freely. So if you applied an electric sort of voltage across it, they'd just whiz across there, feeling no resistance whatsoever. It's a superconductor. 
I don't know if you know about el electricity, but it, it has zero ohms. There's no electrical resistance, which is incredible. And because these electrons can move really, really quickly, if you put a magnetic field near them, they'll just orientate themselves to it immediately. No problem at all. So it's kind of strongly magnetic. But it doesn't matter whether you put a north pole close to it or a south pole next to it, it always aligns itself to be opposite. It's like an eternally repulsive thing. Do, do you know anything very repulsive? No. <laughs> But uh, anyway, this, this is just incredibly repulsive material uh, when, it, when it comes across a magnetic field. So I've arranged these magnets here into, um, into a sort of track, and this thing just always repels the track. Oops. So there's an air gap between there. Sorry? So a Mebus strip uh, yeah, is the technical term, yeah. And, uh, I've seen it done on one of those and it just whizzes around. That's right. The uh, un um, Royal Institution and the University of Cambridge made one of these. They spent about £2,000 on lots and lots of magnets. The track was a lot, lot longer than this. Um, and yes, there's a force repelling it, but there's also a kind of force attracting it. So if I lift it away, I can kind of, it, 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 it just wants to sit in, the, in this well. I've arranged these magnets so that they're north, south, north, upwards. So there's kind of a C-shaped section. Um, and the, the kind of logic of it is that if I went that way, it will, get, it will pull me back. If I went that way, it will pull me back. So it's always going to sit within that well and hover. So the Japanese particularly are really, really interested in this idea of a levitation device, and they want to get a train to work like this. I mean, this, is, this would be a train with no wheels, with no contact point, hardly any energy needed to get the thing moving. Uh, I'm not quite sure how the brakes would work. <laughs> um, but yeah, so uh, they have what's called a magnetic levitation train. Here, they're not using superconductors like this, but they're using electromagnets that they can adjust really, really quickly. And they do have to adjust them quickly because there are kind of variations in this magnetic field as you go along. The magnets aren't all perfectly the same. There are little gaps between them. In some places, the magnetic force is stronger than in other places. So by, na by the nature getting the electrons to arrange themselves really, really quickly according to whatever comes onto them, all that automatic switching is done just instantly. Whereas with a magnetic levitation train from Japan where it's all electronically controlled um, electromagnets, there's some really complicated switching having to go on to make the thing just stick on the track. And if that switching stops working, that's it, you're all dead. <laughs> so it's slightly worrying in a way. Um, but this material, uh, these two little pucks in here, you might just about really see them, two little black things, that's 60 quid's worth of material in there. And these magnets weren't cheap either. Hi. Okay, thanks. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so, uh, if we could get something that was like the magnets cheaper, if we could get this material that was cheaper and that worked at other temperatures that weren't sort of liquid nitrogen, really, really low temperatures, we might end up with this sort of mag magic, almost, floating device. Now, has anyone seen the film Back to the Future? The one that's set in the future. Do you remember they had skateboards that levitated? Oh, that just reminds me of this. Do you know what year that was set in? 2015. Yeah, 2015. That's this year. <laughs> so we better get cracking on this. We really need to get cracking on it. Otherwise, Back to the Future will not be the documentary that I thought it was. I've nearly finished, and I just want to show you one last demonstration with this, um, which usually goes down a bit of a wow. I'm not allowed to make ice cream for you. Oh, 
I would love to, but I can't. Um, and ice cream with liquid nitrogen is, is brilliant. Um, no, 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 no. I haven't, I have, uh, he's got the catering franchise, I haven't. Um, I'll tell you how it works. You, you get some cream, you get some strawberries or chocolate, you put in tons and tons of icing sugar, you mix it all together, and then you stir in some of this stuff. And as it boils, it agitates, it keeps turning over the material, so you don't get one large crystal forming, so it doesn't end up like a, an ice cube. It flows. It's still at minus 18 or whatever, but it flows like Mr. Whippy ice cream does. So you get this lovely, slushy, cold ice cream. It takes about 10 minutes maybe to make, something like that, so you can get some fresh ingredients to ice cream that's just lovely and tasty in about 10, 15 minutes. Whereas with an ordinary ice cream maker, it will take ages to make it, and there's agitation required, and it's just quite a large, involved sort of job. I have to tell you that this stuff is actually quite cheap. It's only 14p a litre to buy. Um, that's because it's a byproduct from getting oxygen out of the air, which is what British Oxygen Corporation and air products do. They, they need the oxygen for scuba divers, for hospitals, and for the steel industries. Um, carting bottles of oxygen around is a very, very convenient way of transporting huge amounts of the gas that they want in a, in a smaller volume, as we uh, talked about the, the squashing down of a gas into a liquid. But in liquefying oxygen, they accidentally liquefy hydrogen, uh, sorry, nitrogen as well. So you remember me saying that 78% of the air is nitrogen, and that's what they start with. So they end up with an enormous amount of byproduct, more byproduct than they really know what to do. So that's why it's so cheap. And you might think, well, why isn't the world why hasn't the world got so many ice cream outlets just making liquid nitrogen ice cream for you? Hester Blumenthal, I think, famously has, has made ice cream using this stuff. There is one, because London is one of these places that's got everything, I think there's one ice cream place that will make liquid nitrogen ice cream for you that isn't NPL. Um, but the, the point is that actually 14p to cool down some ice cream is still a huge cost compared with how cheap electricity is to refrigerate down your um, ice cream. So it really is a cost thing. It's, it's as simple as that. And also the inconvenience of transporting this stuff around. Anyway, let's sort of pseudo make some ice cream. Because why not? So it's the bubbling through that makes the, that stops the, the, the solid from forming. And at the same time cooling it, which is what you want if you've got ice cream. And uh, myself, an NPL's bubble expert, because NPL has a bubble expert, of course, uh, Gianluca, uh, we were in the car park at NPL and we tried this demonstration and we thought we, we, thought we knew what was going to happen. We got our bubble making apparatus, there's this uh, washing up liquid. We put in some liquid nitrogen and we were waiting for the thing to happen and it didn't. <laughs> it just turned to a solid ice cube immediately. There was no bubbling through. And it was just because it was too cold, too quickly. So that's why I'm going to put the secret ingredients and boiling water into here, which will then do what I hope it will do, warm it up enough. So we've got a bubble liquid there, bubble making liquid. And we're going to, this stuff is going to quite furiously bubble through it and make some bubbles. Are you ready? Here we go. Wow. <laughs> so, is this steam? No. It's... It's mist, it's water vapour. So we have bubbles here filling up with uh, well, nitrogen that's bubbling out of there, but also a little bit of um, water vapour. And if it gets too cold, it's, it's oh, no, it, it's still gonna do it. If it gets too cold, it will stop doing this. 
but it seems quite happy to carry on for, for the moment. Oops, sorry. <laughs> now I know why I bought that. Yeah, so now the, the, the bubbles are um, <laughs> going solid. So these are now frozen bubbles. So what do you do? You put some of this onto it. <laughs> and you can just keep going between hot and cold, making these bubbles happen. And I can't think of a better demonstration with liquid nitrogen than this, so that's where I'm going to stop. You can applaud me, and then you can ask me tricky questions. Thank you. What never warms up? It does warm up. <laughs> In here? Yeah. Uh, so there's hot water going in there and there's cold liquid nitrogen in there. They mix and eventually they work out what the temperature in there is going to be. And if I, if I keep adding the liquid nitrogen, the average temperature will keep going down and eventually it will just turn to ice because it will be so cold. Nitrogen yeah. Because you've got it in that container. Yeah. Yeah, a, a lot of people are, are curious about how I can just be carting something so cold around all the time. Um, why isn't it just instantly all boiling off? And, uh, well, the inside of this container is hidden. Well, the inside. The, the, the container is about minus 200. It's been cooled down by the liquid nitrogen itself, so it's not going to boil off there. And at the top of the liquid, there's cold air. And where the air actually meets the liquid, it's so cold, it's about the same temperature. So you have kind of a plug on top. So it's almost as though there's a kind of loose lid on here of gas. So that's... That's why it's not boiling off instantly in the way that you might think if I had some boiled water, if I had some water at boiling point, it's going to carry on boiling off. So, yeah, that's why it doesn't all instantly disappear. Okay. Yeah? Is this how it's delivered? Sorry? Is this how it's delivered? Um, no, it's delivered under pressure. So, um, British Oxygen drive around this uh, big tube thing, giant gas canister, well, liquid canister effectively and it's under pressure it's held under pressure very high pressure I mean I have a vent there so if it gets up, gets above a particular pressure it will tsst, out it will go um, and then to empty it you just release this and then the pressure of the stuff inside boiling pushes it all out and it comes out and it delivers into here so as British oxygen drive around and you may have seen BOC um, and if you go to a hospital you'll see a great big white vat Sometimes it will have oxygen in it, sometimes it will have nitrogen in it, because uh, they use these for freezing um, biological specimens in hospitals, and also for treating warts. They squirt a little bit on there and then that burns the wart off. Um, so those ones will be under pressure. Uh, but guys who know how to use the pressure valves and whatever gently ease it off and then can decant into these handling buckets, which are not held at pressure deliberately so. Um, so this big one here, the top, is loose. And yeah, the, the top's loose. If, the, if that got stuck on here, then the pressure would build up and up and up and up and up and up and eventually it would explode. The, uh, the hazards involved in the connection are this threat of explosion. <coughs> Um, if it's under pressure, and the fact that it's very, very cold, <laughs> and also the fact that it, you can't breathe nitrogen. Well, you can breathe it, but if you increase the proportion of nitrogen in this room, you'll decrease the proportion of oxygen. So, but I've done the maths. If I emptied all of this lot into this room, and the whole of this expanded 700 times to fill this room, we'd still probably be all right, because of air flows and things like that. Does that um Yes, um, the, there's low pressure between the outer vessel 
and the inner vessel. So the thermal insulation will degrade with time. But when it comes to that, you just, well, the opposite of refill it. <laughs> you you, you re-evacuate it. Um, in principle, it, it should last for a very long time. Yeah. Somebody told me that if you just have one of these sitting in the corner of your garage <laughs> because you're going to use it to make ice cream over the weekend or kill the ant's nest or do some weeding, um, it'll evaporate off at about a litre a day. But I, I think these are probably less, it depends on well, how, much, how good they are as insulators. Uh, when you buy them new, they're probably about a tenth of a litre a day, perhaps um, even less, perhaps a bit, a bit more than that. But and this this contains 25 liters, so it should be good for three weeks. <laughs> yes, I buy this, and then in three weeks later, I come back. And there's nothing in it. <laughs> but a 14p a liter that doesn't really bother me. Yeah. Uh, about 20 degrees lower than the boiling point, so about minus. 207, I think. Is it 207, 217, something like that. It's not that much lower. And you think of water being 100 degrees between the boiling point and the freezing point. With nitrogen, it's only 20 degrees. So, yeah, good, good question. And that goes back to that row of things that we had. And there was a picture there of some solid ni um, nitrogen. I think you can get solid nitrogen on Pluto if we, if we look back at those, those values that we had. Yeah, I mean, everything, all, all materials, have a, a boiling point and a, f a freezing point. Uh, and, um, and, and it depends on the material, exactly where those points are. Um, some of them are very close, some of them are very far apart. And, and again, go back to my opening thing, we're used to water boiling. We're used to seeing kind of all these things, uh, but we're not used to thinking about the air being so cold it turns into a liquid, or even so cold it turns into a solid. <laughs> um, yeah, we're used to that idea with, with water because we live in, in sorts of places where you can see water boil and you can see water freeze. So you're used to it. Are there any for solid nitrogen? Uh, no, not that I know of. <laughs> no, I, I can't think of any. There's, uh, there's a list of about 30 applications of liquid nitrogen, but they're not that great, or it wouldn't be that cheap. Um, we, at MPL down the road, we use it for cooling detectors. So, like the cameras on these, the, the chips on these cameras that they're using there, they work a lot, lot better if they're cold. There's thermal noise generated in the electronics, which makes for a, a, a cloudy, a fuzzy photograph. Um, but if you cool that chip down, it just works much, much better, better signal to noise ratio. So we pour the stuff into our detection apparatus and cool the electronics down and you get much better, better signals. And to which temperature you cool it down usually, like if you have a spectrometer? Yeah. How cold do you want the chip to be? Uh, law of diminishing returns, whatever you can get sometimes. I mean, also there are some experiments that we do, we go even liquid helium temperatures or whatever, it's four degrees above absolute zero. So we might have the nitrogen as an outer la cheap lagging jacket and then the, the helium on the, in, in the inside of that. Yeah. But you're right, we should be spooning hydrogen, uh, nitrogen granules in there, shouldn't we? Yeah, any more? A pleasure. And thank you so much to Andrew. Thank you very yeah. much for coming. Thank you. Thanks. And uh, thank you so much for, uh, to everybody to be here. So the next uh, talk will be in April and it will be the Bubble Expo. Oh, gosh. <laughs> who will become. We'll probably do this one again. <laughs> <laughs> probably. So hopefully. Uh, I hope to um, see you there. Thank you so much for Thank coming. Thank you very much. Thank you.